Who's joining us for the first time tonight? Raise your hands. Hey, give them a God bless you, everybody. Give them a God bless you. Give them a God bless you. Oh, no, that, that was so bad, man. You didn't even mean that, man. Yeah. It's the way you lot been then. Yeah. <laughs> I love you. Welcome. Welcome. We've been, we've been taking a journey through the book of Acts um, all this week. And we've been looking at, uh, hey, listen, for those joining us online, welcome. Welcome to the Heist at the Heist Hacienda. Lil Sis, peace. Welcome to all of you who are sneaking a peek at work, wherever you may be in the world. Um, welcome. Say welcome to them, everyone. Welcome. Oh, gosh, you lot are pitiful, man. <laughs> They meant it, honestly. They... <laughs> we've been taking a journey through the book of Acts, and we've been looking at what the church looks like when the church is unleashed. When the church is unleashed, we established on the day of Pentecost when the fire fell from heaven. <laughs> I love this over my head. This is real nice. Did you mean to do this? Did you have kind of like Pentecost in mind when you did this? Because it, it's... Hey man, no man. Hey man, small budgets with big ideas, man. Believe me, man. This is Pentecosti. Pentecosti. When the church and the spirit fell on the day of Pentecost in cove, cove and tongues on the people's head, Jesus had come back to the church. Jesus already told them in Matthew 28, all power is given into me in heaven and on earth. All power. So go ye therefore. And teach all nations, baptizing them in the Son, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to observe whatever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you, even unto the end of the age. And when the Spirit fell on Pentecost, hey, everybody realized Jesus was back. <laughs> Jesus came back. Their thoughts were of Jesus. Their voices were of Jesus. Jesus was in their head. Jesus was in their hearts. They were all sinful people. The church never became perfect on the day of Pentecost. The church became surrendered on the day of Pentecost. They all had issues still, but they were surrendered. And a surrendered person surrenders the fight against God and allows God to work them through their surrendered issues. Hey, that's good. I hope somebody wrote that down. A surrendered person. You see, you think that you have to be perfect in order for God to use you. There's only one perfect person God ever used, and his name was Jesus. There hasn't been another perfect person since. So God isn't looking for perfection. He's looking for surrender. He's looking for intentionality. He's looking for somebody who is serious about being serious. Now serious doesn't mean that you don't smile. I am a Christian. I do not smile. <laughs> I am awaiting the second coming of Jesus Christ. These are sober times. My darling, will you marry me? <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> Not that kind of serious. That's kind of like seriously needs counseling serious. <laughs> <laughs> but serious like you, just crazy like you, issues like you, issues like me, but willing to surrender that to Jesus and allow the spirit of Jesus to grow in us and grow through us and speak through us so that we move with Jesus' feet and Jesus' hands and Jesus' voices. That is all the Lord is asking for. You see, my daughter, Rhea, is perfect. 
and she is perfect because her daddy says she's perfect. That's it. I don't care what you think. (laughs) It ain't your seed. It's my seed. She ain't from your loins. She's from my loins. You didn't make... All right, I'm not going further. (laughs) I made her. And she is perfect because her daddy says she's perfect. When my daughter was born, I was in the operating room when my daughter was born. They pulled her from my wife's body and they put her on the table. The midwife said, do you want to cut the umbilical cord? I went in my back pocket, pull out my knife. I'm like, yeah, I'll cut that bad boy, man. Where I pastored, pastors had to carry knives at least, minimum, man. You know what I mean? I put my gun on the thing before I came in. I kept my... I get my knife on me. I'm like, yeah, I'll cut that bad boy. They said, excuse me, sir, we have a scissors. (laughs) Okay, man. Give me, and I cut it, and no word of a lie. They cut it, and they wrapped her. They put her in my hand like this. I called her name. I said, Rhea. She opened her eyes immediately, and she looked at me. Immediately. I said, I'm your daddy. And I love you. And I kissed her. And I held her to me. And she was perfect. Because her daddy said she was perfect. And when she got home, my wife would breastfeed her. And my wife was just tired at night. And my wife would just breastfeed her and just drop her. No, my wife never dropped her. (laughs) I'm sorry, babe. You never dropped her. I was joking. My wife would get tired. I would just take the baby from her and I would kneel down next to my wife and I would put that baby to my wife's breast. And I'd say, go on, girl, get that breast. (laughs) My daughter would feed. She would feed and my wife would sleep, but it was all right because my daughter was feeding. It's all right, son, don't worry, man. It'll come to you soon, it'll come to you. It'll come to you, man. You know what I mean? It'll come to you. And my daughter would feed, and I would take my daughter. And she was perfect, because her daddy said she was perfect. And then when she kind of moved from the breast to the bottle, I would love to feed my daughter. I would just sit down, put my daughter in my lap, and just feed her. Like, you, you know, the whole thing. Leighton, man, you just got a tribe of children. <laughs> Feed her, and, and that would. Uh, uh, woo! <laughs> woo! <laughs> woo! <laughs> and it was all right. And my daughter used to love it when I used to lift her up like that. Rhea used to love it. Ah, ah, and her face would just open. Ah, 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 and she was ah, like, oh. <laughs> Mm. (laughs) Oh, it just tastes like Farley's Rusk. I know some of the parents are like, no, don't tell them about the baby vomit tasting nice. Let them find out for themselves. She was perfect. Not because of anything that she had done, but because her daddy said she was perfect. I remember when my daughter started to learn how to read. Well, before she started to learn how to read, she was, I was sitting one day, sitting on the throne one day. It's amazing how your mind gets clear when you sit on the throne, isn't it? I haven't figured out the science of that. I haven't figured out the science of that. But it's a wonderful science. I was sitting on the throne, just clearing my mind. And, 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 <laughs> and the toilet door, I mean the throne room door just... <laughs> the, thr- the throne room door just flung open. 
my daughter just came in with a little ABC book. Daddy, daddy, what is this? I said, area, apple. And she turned it over and she goes, and what is this? I said, be real, ball. And she turned over the next page and she goes, and daddy, what is this? I said, see Rhea, cat. She closed the book and she said, good boy, daddy, good boy. <laughs> then she ran out of the throne room, man. Like, Can you close the door? And there's some privacy in this throne room. But she was perfect. Not because of anything that she had done, but because her daddy said she was perfect. I remember the first time I caught Rhea in a lie. I was walking up the stairs at my house and I saw writing on the side of the wall. It was writing. And I said, Rhea, yes, daddy, come. She came. I said, Rhea, is this your handwriting? No, daddy. I said, aha, I know whose handwriting it is. Now, my wife is in the kitchen listening to all of this. So I said, Yvonne. She said, yes, daddy. I said, come. So she came. I said, Yvonne, is this your handwriting? And she went, no, daddy. So we both looked at Rhea. I said, Rhea. Is this your handwriting? And when she went to answer, I said, wait. I said, Rhea, you know the rule in our house. The rule in our house is this. If you tell the truth, mom and daddy will be mad, but that's it. But if you lie, I will detach mommy's arm <laughs> and I will beat you within an inch of your life with mommy's arm. Hey, if you're big enough to lie, you're big enough to catch a beat down. That's in my house, man. And mom started, it. yes, Rhea? <laughs> Mommy started detaching her arm, like, yeah, Rhea. So, Rhea, I'm going to ask you again, is this your handwriting? And she was like, <laughs> I said, okay. So remember, you tell the truth. Yes, daddy. I said, okay. And she confessed. And I said, come and clean down the wall. And she came back with some like, metal Brillo pads, started taking off wallpaper. <laughs> I'm like, it's all right, it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> daddy has your sins covered. <laughs> and daddy washed it away. And she was perfect. Not because of anything that she had done, but because her daddy said she was perfect. I remember the day Rhea was sitting at the table and she said, Daddy, why do I look like you? And then I looked at her mum quizzically. And I looked back at her and I said, because I made you. And she said, Daddy, you made me good. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, it was all I could do to fit in my own head. I said, girl, it's all in the DNA. It's all in the DNA. And then I remember when she started to learn to hear her daddy's voice. You know, when the kids are young, you bargain with the kids for eating. I'm finished. I'm finished. Okay, eat three more and you can finish. And then you just divide the food into four chunks. Eat three and you can finish. So Rhea always used to sit at the top of the table. I would sit to her left, her mum would sit to her right, and between the two of us, we would feed her. Obviously, now I'm back at the head of my own table because she's a big child now. But in the early days, she would sit at the head of the table. And so, like, Daddy, I'm finished. You know, Mommy, I'm finished. No, eat three more, such and such and such. My wife phones me up. I was away preaching. I think I was in Australia at the time. We, we're speaking on Skype. She goes, Yvonne, she goes, Eddie, Rhea had me cracking up tonight. I said, what happened? She said, I'm feeding her at the table. She said, she's finished. You know what I mean? I said, no, eat three more pieces and you can finish. She said, she turned to your empty chair, <laughs> looked at your empty chair for a moment, and then turned back to me and said, Daddy said I only need to eat two. <laughs> I was like, 
I'm like, <laughs> and mom said, no, Rhea, you eat three. One greater than your father is here. You know what I mean? Wonderful. But she is perfect. Not because of anything she had done, but because I was perfect. I remember when she learned to call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. My daughter called on the name of Jesus twice. No, my daughter called on the name of Jesus three times. Oh, my Lord. The first time my daughter called on the name of Jesus, she was in a Christian bookstore at the checkout counter fighting my wife, fighting my wife for sweeties. Mommy, can I have these sweeties? No, Rhea, put them back. My wife had just bought her books and DVDs and CDs. Mommy, I need these sweeties. No, Rhea, put them back. Mommy, please, please, give me these sweeties. No, Rhea, I said put them back. My wife grabbed my daughter, my, my, my daughter grabbed my wife's bag with her purse, with her left hand, put her right hand in the air and said, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> hey. My wife said, in the name of Jesus, stop your foolishness. <laughs> Remember another time, she was younger than that. She was younger than that, Leighton. I couldn't find my credit cards. I'd gone to the shop to buy something for my mum. I was heading over to West London from East London to see my mum. I couldn't find my credit card. I got back into my car just vexed. Ria said, what's the matter, daddy? She was young. Must have been about four I said, I can't find my credit cards, Ria. I got to go home. I can't find my credit card. I said, pray that I find my credit cards. You know, you just throw it out there, loose. Pray that I don't I find my credit cards. Pray that I find my credit cards. She started praying, dear Jesus. And I think she prayed to Jesus and then some apostles. And then she, <laughs> she prayed to like Noah. And just uh, <laughs> she just called on a few biblical characters. Right? <laughs> She didn't understand the state of the dead yet. She knew they were all in the Bible. So let me just call on all of them. <laughs> and I'm sitting there listening to them. What kind of Catholic prayer is this, my... <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. I couldn't know. What has my wife been teaching my daughter? But as she was praying, and I'm looking at the road, the Lord showed me while she was praying exactly where my credit card was. It was weird. It was gloriously weird because the place it was, I would only have found if God had showed me. I got out of my car, went straight to where it was. You know where it was? We used to hang our coats over the banister when you come in the house, hang it over the banister. The spirit showed me that my credit card had somehow come out of the inside of my pocket, fallen down and wedged itself in between the coats. Believe me, that could only come as divine revelation. I went into the house, I just pulled the coats aside as it was prayed for, as it was revealed, there it was. And I picked up my credit card and I put my credit card in my pocket. I said, come Ria, I'm going to take you shopping. <laughs> I only bought her lollies, but I took her shopping. <laughs> she is perfect. Everything for my daughter is a song now. My daughter is writing songs. Everything for Ria is a song. Rhea has a song for everything. I mean everything. Rhea has a song for everything. <laughs> everything. I mean everything. Rhea has food songs. Because I love my mommy's cooking fritters. Daddy make fritters. Oh. Fritters from daddy. Oh. Shout. Oh, for fritters. Maria <laughs> has a song for everything. Everything. Oh, school. I don't want to go to school. I don't mind being a fool. I just want to stay home and watch TV today. Oh, school. Who really, really needs school? You know what I mean? I don't let her get to the third verse, man. You know what I mean? I don't. Get up. Come here. Here. Now. Now, are you going to beat me, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
She is perfect. And she is not perfect because of anything she has done. She is perfect because her daddy says she's perfect. A whole bunch of surrendered imperfect people on the day of Pentecost are scattered because of the stoning of the young, brilliant deacon Stephen. They're scattered, but they are surrendered people. And I'm saying this to you tonight. I've gone way off. Well, I'm still on my subject. I don't even know if we're going to get to the sermon. What else are we doing tonight? <laughs> we're just going to drink hot drinks afterwards and just chill, innit? it? All right, let me just take my time and preach tonight. Man. Is that all right? Can I just take my time and preach? Right? Let, me, let me say this to you. Let me say this to you. Stop. Stop. This whole, I must be perfect for Jesus to use me. Jesus cannot use me because of all of my issues. Stop. Now, I'm not excusing your issues. And I'm not excusing your, 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 your you know, struggles that you may have. And I'm not justifying struggles that you may have. But stop. Stop already. Stop already. Stop excusing yourself from being used by God by placing your issues in front of God as a reason why God will not and cannot use you. Stop doing that. Stop doing that to the salvation that it took to purchase you. Stop doing, doing that to the salvation and the glory and the blessings that it takes to keep you. Because the church in Acts is not a perfect church. But they are surrendered church. They've given themselves with all their spots and all their blemishes and all their issues to Christ. And they're saying, here I am, Lord. <laughs> they're not saying like Saul did on the road to Damascus, who are you, Lord? They're saying like Ananias did when he was told to go and lay hands on a blind soul on Straight Street. Here I am, Lord. That's what they're saying. And that's what God wants you to say, South Australia. That's what God wants you to say, Adelaide. No, not who are you, Lord, but here I am, Lord. With all my weaknesses and all my faults, but I'm willing to give you all my weaknesses and all my faults if you believe you can use me and grow me away from those things. And grow your kingdom inside of me in spite of those things where they are no longer a problem and I no longer serve them because in heart, mind and spirit, I serve you. If you're willing to take me in that condition, here I am, Lord. Here I am. The church at Pentecost is that church. Because they believe the words of Jesus. Anyone that comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. They believe that. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world was already condemned before Jesus got here. Jesus came to a condemned world. He didn't come to condemn the world. The world was already condemned. So God did not come to South Australia and to Adelaide to condemn South Australia and Adelaide. He came so that South Australia and Adelaide might live. He came that Australia might live. He came that a West that intentionally rejects Jesus might once again live. The church is scattered. The church is scattered. Paul or Saul has only just recovered from his blindness. It's a couple of months. It's a couple of months. And the church is scattered. I want to talk to you about the issue of where you are called Christian first. And the idea of where you need to be called Christian first. Turn or slide with me in your Bibles. Whether on your print or whether on your phone or whether on your 
iPads or whether on your whatever things you use, you know, if it's not an iPad, it's not really important anyway. <laughs> on your Androids. Turn with me to Acts chapter 11. Oh, you're going to love this one, Georgie. I'll tell you what, you're going to love this one, girl. You're going to love this one. Acts chapter 11, we're going to read from verse 19. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. And they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene who, on coming into Antioch, spoke to the Greeks. Mm. Spoke to the Greeks also, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. News of this came to the heirs of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, he rejoiced, and he exalted them all the more to remain faithful with steadfast devotion, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas, listen, then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Hallelujah. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so it was that for an entire year, they met with the church and taught a great many people, and here comes the words, and it was in Antioch first that the disciples were called Christians. And it was in Antioch first that the disciples were called Christians. And it was in Antioch first that the disciples were called Christians. And it was in Antioch First, that the disciples were called Christians, and it was in Antioch. First, that the disciples were called Christians. Not in Jerusalem amongst the believers, but in Antioch amongst the Greeks that they were first known and called Christians. They weren't called Christians by themselves. They called themselves followers of the way. <laughs> hey. <laughs> the Jews called them heretics. It was the unbelieving Greeks, the Gentiles, the whores and the prostitutes and the believers in Artemis and the worshippers of gods of stone and metal and, 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 and sea and land and sky. It was those people who first called them Christian. It seems to me that Christian more than being a title of what we call ourselves, Christian actually seems to be a, a badge of honor. It's easy to call ourselves Christian, isn't it? Come on now. <laughs> it's easy to call ourselves Christians, and Christians we are. But when the people in Antioch call them Christians. When the people in Antioch labeled them Christians, it had a whole different connotation. A whole different connotation. They called them Christians because they saw Christ in them. If we in Adelaide, if we in South Australia, if we 
in this great country of Australia, if we in this South Pacific are going to be called Christians, we must be called and known as Christians in Antioch first. We must be called Christians by non-Christians first. And not simply by Christians. Because Christian isn't a title. Christian is a badge of honor that somebody confers upon you when they see in you someone greater than you. That's what Christian is. That's what Christian is. That's what Christian is. You're wondering how we're going to work South Australia. You're wondering how we're going to work Adelaide. I'm wondering how we're going to work the bong. Now, I know some of you just said the bong. You lot are on the bong in the bong. It's not that kind of bong. I'm talking about Kurum bong. We getting high on life. That's all. And high on Jesus. That's the bong. We're wondering how we're gonna work Kurumbong and Morissette and head out towards Central Coast and head up towards Newcastle and Toronto. The way to work it is found in the text. So let's just do a case study tonight together. If you're taking notes on your phone, write them down. You're going to like this. Oh, she's got an iPad mini. <laughs> God bless you, my sister. <laughs> yeah, listen, God bless you too. God bless you too. Was it a Samsung? Yep. Hey, yeah, God bless you, man. God bless you. God bless you. I've got a Samsung note. I shouldn't have said that. I got a little note. Well, I had one. My daughter took it from me. <laughs> She's perfect still, though. She's perfect. <laughs> Let's do a case study from Acts chapter 11 together. Let's do a case study from Acts chapter 11 together. The first thing you note is this, that the church is scattered. You will have trouble being a Christian. I told you that last night. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're going to have trouble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You will have trouble being a Christian. And if some of you are still struggling with that, turn to the person and say, so get over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get over it, man. Get over it, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to have trouble, so get over it. The church is scattered. Because of the death of Stephen. Hey, but let me tell you something. Something just popped into my head. Something just popped into my head. Even the people who scatter the church are brought to the salvation of the Lord and to the church that they scatter. Hey! Hey! hey. hey. Saul, the scatterer of the church, is blind in Antioch. Two chapters later, he's, he's blind in Damascus. Two chapters later, Barnabas goes and finds that same man who is scattering the church and brings him to Antioch to speak a word for Jesus Christ. So don't you worry. You know what I've learned about the sovereign will of God? The sovereign will of God is sovereign. Sovereign. You know what that means? That means God doesn't need, require, or even ask your permission, or even want your opinion when he decides to be God. That is different from God's will that you give your life to him. That he allows to be subject to your decision. But when it comes time for God to do what God wants to do in the earth, 
He ain't asking your permission to do that because that has nothing to do with your soul salvation and you giving your life to him. Daddy, can I go over there and play with my friends? No, Rhea, why not? There is no why not, there's just no. <laughs> Sit down and don't move until I tell you. Now, you may think that's cruel, but in my house, that works. I am an old school parent. I am old school. Sit down and don't move until I tell you. And don't you make the mistake of going and say to my daughter, it's all right, your daddy won't mind. Trust me, my daughter will stay there until her daddy says she can move. Her granddad can go and say, come. She will look at me, and unless I say move, she'll say, it's all right, granddad. I'm okay where I am. <laughs> because that is the sovereign will of her father. Because she is surrendered to me. And I am surrendered to her. And there are times when I will explain myself to my daughter because she needs explanation. Why, daddy? Because the people over there, they smell. <laughs> but when God is ready to just move in the earth, God will bend everything to his will. <laughs> he will bend everything to his will. So let's look at this. Look, let's look at this. You don't need to worry about being persecuted and you don't need to worry about the people who fight against you and fight against your beliefs because they're not simply fighting against you they're fighting against God not only are they fighting against God but God turns everything to his will eventually anyway so let them fight and let them say what they're going to say and let them do what they're going to do Jesus said to Pilate, listen, the only reason why I'm here is because you have power which has been given to you. <laughs> the only reason why I'm here is because you've been given power from above to keep me here. Believe me, I've got people who can fight for me. Not them disciples outside who are denying me, believe me. Not them. <laughs> oh, I don't know if you've ever read that great book, The Story of Redemption. When there was in the garden... When they was in the Garden of Gethsemane, read it, it's a beautiful image. When they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, Ellen White says, the angels stood there, legions of them with swords drawn. Because they couldn't believe that they were taking Jesus. So they're all looking at each other and saying, we're going to step in and we're going to kill somebody, aren't we? Come on now. We're going we're to do that. And then Peter went and chopped off the guy's head. You know, Peter was trying to chop off his head, but the guy moved and he caught his ear. You know what I mean? And Jesus was like... Peter, what's wrong with you, man? What's, what's wrong with you? Go home. What's wrong with you, man? You know, and the guy was like, oh. <laughs> and, and Peter said, Jesus said, don't you think that if I just gave the command, my father would just send a legion of, Israel, of angels? Ellen White says that when Jesus said that, they all went, charge! And Gabriel was like, whoa, 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 whoa. The command hasn't been given. The command hasn't been given. The command just whoa, whoa, back up, back up, back up, back up. They, <laughs> just don't want to kill a human, man. I, just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe what they're doing to our Lord, man. I can't believe our Lord is even allowing that, man. How that work, man? How that work? So. <laughs> The church is scattered. Sorry if you don't like my theology, man. So I don't know what to do with you, man. <laughs> so the church is scattered. The biblical narrative is so good. This is the original Game of Thrones, believe me. <laughs> this is the original. Forget about Joffrey being dead. This is the original Game of Thrones, man. Forget... <laughs> Oh! <laughs> Forget about King Joffrey, man. Forget about him, man. So the church, 
<laughs> the church is scattered. And the story says they speak to no one except Jews. They speak to no one except Jews. So here's the first lesson. Number one, we mustn't allow pressure to silence our voice as Christians. Come on now. I'm serious. Church family, don't allow pressure to silence your voice as Christians. You may not have all the answers, but you're uni students. So you shouldn't be reading books that just give you a simple view of God. You need to read people who give you broad views of God. Read Christian authors in our community and outside of our community that give you broader views of God and who God is. And not only the reason for the Bible, but the very reason for faith itself. Because you know, once you go to university and you're having to deal with natural thought and you're having to deal with existentialism, university can be a faith shredder shredder they take your little sabbath school faith and they stick it in a meat grinder and they give it back to you as gluten steaks <laughs> and you look at your faith and you're like oh, 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 i don't know what i believe anymore don't allow pressure to silence Read and be exposed. And for the things that you don't know, don't feel embarrassed. Figure out who knows. Believe me, the one reason why I love living in Kurumbong is because I can just comfortably admit I don't know everything. But I can take you to somebody who does know. And while he's talking to you, I'll learn from what he's saying and go back and verify and read for myself. And next time when somebody asks me that question, I can give you an answer. But the greatest answer that they're looking for is the answer of your personal life. People want to know, not if what you're saying is correct, but if what you're saying works. <laughs> That's all they want to know. Does it work? When your loved ones die, can you actually have peace that passes all understanding? When the world caves in on you, can you truly believe that there is still a God out there? When everybody writes you off and sends you hate mail and they just cyber, they just cyber stalk you and bully you, can you still have a sense of completeness and wholeness from outside of yourself? When all your friends lock you off, can God actually fulfill his word and say, anybody that you give up for me, I'll or anything, I will repay to you 10 times in this life, not the life to come, in this life and eternal life in the life to come. They want to know if it works. You're 21 and you're a virgin. How is that humanly possible? How is that possible? I mean, you don't have sex at all, like nothing. Like, not even a little, like nothing. You're like, no. How do, how do you do that? You see, for some of you, you think that because you've never left the church and the only Coke you've ever done is Coca-Cola, you don't have no story. <laughs> You think because you kept yourself pure, you need to go out and get a prodigal son and a prodigal daughter story. Oh, you hear my testimony and people who testify like I testify. You honestly think that if we could choose again, we would choose to do the things we've done in our lives. You honestly think that if I could choose again as a 14-year-old, I would have chose the life I chose between 14 and 25. Hey, no. And you think because you don't have that story, you have no story. When you don't understand that the fact that you haven't done that is the story. The fact that you haven't been down that road is the story. The fact that you've kept yourself is the story. And the fact that you haven't and you've come and met a God who's restored you so much that when you tell your story, people are like, 
What are you lying for? Nah, nah, nah. You don't even look like a person who even knows what the right side of a bottle looks like. What are you talking about? Nah, you ain't never been on alcohol. You ain't never... What are you talking about? Nah, you ain't never gambled. Nah, what are you talking about? You ain't never been a self-harmer. What are you, what are you lying for? Why? Because the grace of God covers you so deeply now, they can't associate that story with you. So let me say this to you. If you've never left, don't hanker for a life that has left. Tell your story. And if you don't know what your story is, then sit down and think about your story and stop complaining that you have no story. Because if you just sat down and thought just piece by piece, you would see how and where God has been with you. And if you've left, God can renew your story. And if you've stayed and your life is a mess, God can renew your story. Whether the persecution come from within or whether the persecution come from without, do not allow pressure and persecution to silence you. Lesson number one. Oh, sorry. All right, my time is up. <laughs> so what does the story say? He said, they spoke to no one except the Jews, but there were some who spoke to the Hellenists. Lesson number two, speaking to ourselves about ourselves is good, but it's not enough. We got to just stop this self-analysis. Come on now. You know why Adventists get into so much problems? Because we spend all our life talking to ourselves about ourselves, Pastor. And then we get into what I call idle conversations. When you spend all your time talking to yourself about yourself, you get into idle conversations like, should we ordain women? That's an idle conversation. That's foolishness. Should we ordain women? What kind of question is that? Are women human beings? Does the spirit fall on human beings? Then why are you asking a question of whether or not you should ordain them for? That's an idle conversation. Should we have sex on the Sabbath? Like, crying out loud, are you serious? <laughs> Sabbath sex is wonderful. <laughs> it's just rest. I don't know, just like... Like, every time the Pope sneezes, we just catch a cold. Oh, the Pope just did this, and the Pope just did that. Oh, and the beast, and the Antichrist, and the beast, and the Antichrist. Let me settle this question for you. In Revelation chapter 22, when John says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, is the beast there? Is the Antichrist there? Are any of these beasts or Antichrist there? No, they're not. So why are you keeping your eyes on them for when they ain't going to be there? Just keep your eyes on the person who is going to be there and let that person keep his eyes on them. Revelation ain't deep. <laughs> Revelation ain't deep. Stop making it like, oh! <laughs> there was an old man who sat at a seminary while the young theological jocks played football with a football and football. And one of the balls came over by him and he stopped it with his foot as he was reading his Bible. A young jock came over and he kicked it to this young theolo theology student, theology student, walked over and he saw him reading the book of Revelation. And he looked down on him the old janitor, who was the man who just cleaned the toilets in the corridors and just swept the place. He says, oh, you're reading the book of Revelation. And the old man looked at him and he said, yes. He said, oh, do you understand all the apocalyptic images and the prophecies of Revelation and the message of Revelation? And he said, yes, I understand it fully. And he says, you do? Because he, he was getting a bit offended there. Because obviously he was a 
theology student and he had studied all the great eschatological truths of the Bible and all the great theologians. So we said, do you understand uh, the message? And he said, yes. He said, well, what then is the essential message of the book of Revelation? And the old man looked at him with, him with a knowing smile and he said, Jesus wins. <laughs> <laughs> Revelation ain't deep. Revelation simply says this from beginning to end. Jesus is with the church in every age and in every situation until he comes. Regardless who pops up on the scene, beasts, antichrists, don't even look at them. Follow the lamb. Because when the dust settles, the only one that is left is the lamb. Talking to ourselves about ourselves is good. For we must know where we're from. You must have a deeper understanding of the Bible. You must have a deeper understanding of your Adventist heritage and history. You must have a deeper understanding of your spiritual history. But talking to ourselves about ourselves constantly, day in, day out, day in, day out, is not good. Because we, in the end, get into idle conversations. This navel is a special navel. <laughs> this navel is a remnant navel. <laughs> Your navel is not. <laughs> this navel is an inner. It's an inner because it is surrendered to Jesus. Your navel is an outie <laughs> because it is in rebellion. <laughs> Aha. Mm. So number two, if you're going to be unleashed, number one, don't allow pressure to silence you. Number two, stop talking to yourself about yourself. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like spiritual madness. Yes, I am, I am one of the remnant. I am, I am, I am, I am one of the chosen. I am, I am, I am. Oh, speaker, listen to me, speak. And then we end up fighting each other over foolishness. We end up shredding each other over foolishness. We will kill each other over a position in the Bible. We will kill each other over a text. Because we spend all our time talking to ourselves about ourselves. That's what they did here. They spoke to themselves about themselves. But the story says that there were some among them who didn't want to do that. So they spoke to the Greeks. Number three, lesson number three. Somebody has got to speak to the Greeks. Somebody has got to speak to the non-Christians among us. Somebody has got to get into society and get their hands dirty for Jesus. Somebody has got to figure out how do we open up ministries and cafes and places of refuge and places where people are saved and places where people are healed where no one wants to go. How do we do acts of service for people in our cities and in our state where even if they don't serve Jesus Christ, it's just the right thing to do anyway? Jesus cured how many lepers? Ten. How many of them came back? Did Jesus say, those ungrateful, be lepers again? <laughs> you? Hey, peace, man. Peace, yeah, man. Go on home, man. Go on home. Tell your family, yo. No, Jesus never did that. Why? Because even though they never came back, they were still going to go and say, we're healed because of that man down there. I'm able to eat because of that church over there. I'm able, to, I'm able to educate my children in the evening because of some of those graduates over there who come and run homework club. My kids are able to get something to eat in the morning because them over there, they run a little breakfast club next to the school. 
to this school where everyone is right enough. Somebody has got to speak to the Greeks. Somebody's got to speak to the Greeks. And that is the challenge of your generation. How do we get our lives and our ideas and our ministries? How do we unleash that amongst the people? You've got to think of church in a different way. Because church is not a building that we get our people to. Church is a community of people that bring people into a building. So we ran the Ballers Club. Leighton's come down to London and played the Ballers Club. He's played with Shea and all them guys. They figured out our friends don't come to church. How can we get our friends to come to church? So they started a basketball ministry. It's been running for seven years. Do you know the amount of people that have come to faith just by a basketball? If the church, if they won't come to where the church weekly gathers to worship, then we will just bring ourselves to where you are. Because the church is portable. Because the church isn't a building. The church is you and the church is me. The church is us. We are the church. Somebody has got to figure out how we speak to the Greeks. And it's not hard because we live among them. We are them. We know their language. We have non-believers in our family. We have non-believers that we live next to. We are not Christians in a little bubble. We're not Christians in a little bubble. <laughs> Somebody has got to figure out how we speak to the Greeks. And then listen. Listen to this. He said they spoke to the Greeks and proclaim Jesus as Lord. Mm. They said, if you're looking for somebody to rule your life, try Jesus. They're saying that the things that you're chasing in this age, the materialism that you're chasing in this age, the education that you're chasing in this age, the sense of wholeness that you're chasing in this age, while all of those things are noble and they are good things. They are not the things you should serve because they are transient and changeable. Let me introduce you to somebody who is not. Not something, someone who is not. And they sense that in their personal lives. So proclaim Jesus as Lord. Proclaim him. Man, I had to go to a prison to visit one of my members' sons. This son of hers was part of a duo comedy act back in the, 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 the late, the, the early noughties, end of the 90s, early noughties. He was the actual talented one in the comedy act. The other guy was good, but he was great. A comedian, great. I went to visit him in jail. I went to visit him in jail and he told me his journey. Because he grew up in church. He grew up in the church that I was serving in as an intern. And he talked about this gift that he had. He would turn up to improv clubs and just get up on the stage, do like 30 minutes, 20 minutes of improv, bring the house down and get like four or five hundred pounds just to do that ended up going around the improv clubs just doing that he would be on tv just brilliant guy and then somebody introduced coke to his life and then from that introduced coke to his life they introduced crack to his life they introduced crack to his life and obviously, with crack comes all the issues that comes with it. He was kind of dropping off because of the addiction. He weren't on this TV as much because of the addiction, because his stuff wasn't as funny. He wasn't as good because of the addiction. Obviously, he starts getting into crime, and he starts ending up in jail. And people have seen him in jail, and they're like, oh, bruv, hold on. I just saw you on TV the other day. What are you doing in? Oh, man, you know, parking fines. Oh, Okay. But then they'd see him in jail again. They're like, bro, you're back in jail again. What's going on, fam? 
Oh, you know, my baby mother, CSA, you know, I'm not paying the child support. In the end, he's coming back so much, he just got tired. He got tired of lying. When they asked him, this is what he said to me. When they would ask him, he said, Eddie, all I said was crack. He said they never asked him another question. Because <laughs> that one word summed up his whole life. What are you doing here again, fam? Crack. Oh, all right, then, cool. <laughs> that was it. I remember reading Romans chapter 12, 1 to 3 to him. I, 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 I beseech you, therefore, my brother, in view of God's mercy, that you present yourself as living sacrifice to God, holy and acceptable, which is a reasonable act of service. And be not conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When I read that to him, when I read that to him later, his mind blew up. He went, wow. I ain't never seen that text before. We prayed. And as I walked out of the prison, I was walking to my car. I said, one word summed up that guy's whole life. And that word was crack. Crack. I said, I've got to find a word that sums up my life. When people ask me, Eddie, how come your life has changed the way it is? How come, Eddie, you're the man you are today? How come, Eddie, you ended up being a minister? How come, Eddie, when everybody has written you off, you are today? How come? I said one word, Christ. <laughs> Christ. Christ. Proclaim Jesus as Lord. When people ask how you're able to make it the way you make it, just say Jesus. And let that be either the conversation killer or the conversation opener. <laughs> it's going to just be one or the other. <laughs> uh, oh, okay then, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Jesus, I mean, how Jesus? How's that work? So how are you able to just make it the way you make it? Hey, Jesus. Proclaim Jesus as Lord. And the story says that many people believed. Lesson number five. People will turn and people will believe. Oh, I don't care what the stats say. Stats have nothing to do with heaven. Value Genesis has nothing to do with heaven. Public opinion has nothing to do with heaven. If you proclaim Jesus, if you're intentional about your faith, if you're intentional about speaking to the Greeks, if you're willing to get your life out there on the front line, people will believe and people will turn. They will believe and turn. I don't care what community you come from. We are dealing with the eternal God. People will believe and turn. But there is a follow-on to that. And it is this, which is the next lesson. It says, after they had preached to the people... And, and led the people to Christ, the story said, and so it was that for an entire year, they met and taught the people. You've got to stay with the people. Stop treating the people like a spiritual pet project. If you're not willing to be committed to people and the journey of leading their life to Christ. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Let somebody else lead them to Jesus. Because you've got to be willing to journey with people. And in our church, we're too impatient. Or, oh, you're not interested in having Bible studies and getting baptized. I will forget you then. I'll dust the feet off. I'll dust the dust off of my shoes and move on to somebody else. But somebody else comes along who is willing to be patient. If there's one thing I've learned is that people need time to grow. People need time to grow. Well, how long should we wait? How long has God been waiting for you with your impatience? Obviously, with that kind of question, he's still waiting for you. People need time to grow. 
I know some of you want to just grow up quick and you've got all these crazy theologies that are trying to stick you in a spiritual microwave and cook you quick. Oh, well, if you do this and you do that and you do this, because remember that Jesus is about to go, he's going to call your name any minute and the probation is about to close and you've got to stand faultless before the throne, between, sinless between, because there's going to be no mediator. Ah! Huh? What kind of matrix jigsaw puzzle theology is that? And so you stick yourself in a spiritual microwave. Let me cook myself quick. Quick, Jesus, come. Quick, Jesus, come. Come, I'm ready now. I'm ready now. Ding. And you come out. Oh, 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 oh. People need people who are willing to give them time to grow. You know who my favorite of all of the disciples is? Peter. Peter, talk too much, talk too quick, fall even quicker. Jesus got so frustrated with him, he would just call him Simon. Oh, Simon, 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 Simon. He called him that just to remind him of himself. Oh, Simon, Simon, Simon. What am I going to do with you, boy? What am I going to do with you? Lord, you see all of these disciples here, this little group here, all of them are going to run and leave you, but not me. I'm your man. I got you, Jesus. I got you. All of these lot, look at them. They all think they're pious with their London sweatshirts and everything like that, man. They will run in their Avondale sweatshirts. They will run and leave you. But not me, Jesus. And what happened? <laughs> a little 10-year-old girl. You're a disciple, aren't you? No, 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 what are you talking about? No, 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 I know you, I know you, I know you. My auntie saw you. She said she collected fish from you on the, on the seaside. You, that, that's you, wasn't it? What are you talking about? I don't know that man. Move from me, move from me. And what does Jesus do? Peter's my favorite. He's my favorite. He's my favorite. Because Jesus gave Peter time to grow and he, he denies Jesus and Jesus brings him back. And then on the day of Pentecost, the spirit falls and he baptizes thousands. But Peter is still a nationalistic, racist Jew. And Jesus has to send him a vision of, 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 of barbecue kangaroo and chili, chili con chicken snake. And the Lord is saying, yeah, come on, go on, go on, go on, throw some squid on the barbie. And he's like, Lord, I don't eat squid. You know I don't eat squid. I only eat gluten steaks. You know I only. And he says, no, don't call them come on and clean. Then he understands that the Lord is sending him to talk to the Gentiles. And he goes and he confesses to the Gentiles that I've been calling you come on or unclean. I've been calling you come on and clean. But the Lord has shown me I wouldn't, I shouldn't. And he, can, and he confesses and he has it with the Gentiles. They fellowship. But as soon as the Jew comes along, he just acts like he doesn't want to know the Gentiles anymore. He falls back into his same little foolish way. Spirit has fallen on him. Still being used at Pentecost, still leading the church, but growing. And the Lord sends Paul. Paul. <laughs> Paul's just as dysfunctional as this one. Oh, the things that I don't want to do, I do. And the things that I do, I don't want to do. What's wrong with me? God sends growing Paul to still growing Peter growing Paul says what's wrong with you you're going to be a Christian or not this is the Christian way you know what Peter says in his epistle he says I've learned just humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and in time he will lift you up people need time to grow give them time to grow and lastly let the people call you Christian. Somebody got some water here. My, my throat is, is um, it's just drier than a parrot's bum. Let the people call you Christian. Is that somebody's water there? 
I said, I don't know. Yeah, you can try it, Pastor. I mean, I'll let it land and then I'll pick it. <laughs> Just let it. Two thousand and seven was the killing season in London. It was the killing season. Teenage crime was just out of control. And teenagers were killing themselves, killing each other. It was just bad. It was bad. Things came to a head when a 16-year-old went into the house of a 14-year-old and shot him in his bed. I mean, it was bad. It was bad. We were in the youth department. We were in the youth department, 2008, excuse me. And we decided that enough was enough. The church had to take a stand as young people. Because in South London, where I was pastoring, where I had been pastoring, I was burying them. I was burying them. Families were coming to me, can you bury my child? We decided when I was youth director, one of three youth directors, that we had had enough. The theme for our whole time of office, Roland, was live. Live. And live meant living intentionally versus existing. It was an acronym. We are going to live intentionally and not just exist. So we decided as a youth department that we would have a march. A march for life. Oh. Oh. London had never seen anything like this. Oh my gosh. We got all the park finders out. I'm talking like we got out something like 500 marching park finders in full uniform. We got out a two, three hundred, two hundred just marching band with drums. Just marching band with drums and just, just, duh. The big drum corps just. And then 6,000 people marched. We met at Trafalgar Square by the thousands and we just marched. We marched from Trafalgar Square all the way down Whitehall, past, um, um, past um, Downing Street, past Parliament. We marched all the way from the seat of power to South London in Kennington and the killing fields where kids were dying. And we gathered in the park gathered in the park prior to that I had been sitting with a minister who had talked to us about what he called the urban blessing he was doing what I was doing but I had just come in as an intern and he talked about working in the inner cities and he was talking about a housing estate, government housing estate. A rough one that he was working at. And he said one evening, as he was going home, one of the people from the estate, they came out of their door and they said, Oi, pastor. And he turned around and he said, yeah. He said, I want you to know you're doing an effing good job. God bleep bleep bless ya. And he said, that is an urban blessing. He said, oh, that we could all be so blessed. I remember sitting there as a little intern thinking, I want an urban blessing. No, I want one of them urban blessing. <laughs> and off to work, we went in the inner cities. So wind forward all those years, five years later, in her house in Bermondsey, in South London, is a beautiful woman called Jackie Barrett. 
Lord Jackie Mumford, and Jackie Barrett. She sits watching us on TV because we're being interviewed in Trafalgar Square. It's making all the news. It's just big news. We're being interviewed. And as she's watching, she said to us later, something said to me, you've got to contact those boys. Jackie is a short little woman about this big from Bermondsey, South East London. Beautiful little English woman. And she talks like that because she smokes a lot of cigarettes. She talks like that and she laughs. Ah. <laughs> I went to her house. I said, Jackie, I need to use the toilet. Can I use your toilet? She said, nah, stand there and wet yourself. Ah. <laughs> well, of course you can use the toilet. What kind of stupid question is that? She tried every single way she could to get in contact with Colin, who was the one who was doing most of the main interviews. But we had finished the march and gone straight to big camp. It took her a week to track down Colin. And when she tracked down Colin, Colin went and met with her, came to work the next day, said, Eddie, there's somebody you've got to come and meet. We went to meet with her the next week and we heard Jackie's story. Jackie had a daughter called Bonnie. Bonnie got into drug addiction. Bonnie became a prostitute. Bonnie ended up being killed by a serial killer who killed her, dismembered her, and to this day, she doesn't know where any part of her daughter is buried. She started a group called Fame, Families Against Murder Escalating. And we would go to her house and sit in her front room and she would gather mothers from around London and around England. Mothers and sisters whose kids or sibling had been brutally murdered. And we would work with her and the group and what they were doing. The next year, we decided to hold the same march again. And we marched this time as a memorial lane. We held a memorial march, Roland. We held a memorial, Jake. And we marched again by the thousands. But this time, we marched with all these families who had lost people and had been murdered. And we marched with them. And we marched to the park and we had a memorial service and the people spoke and we had special items and then at the end of it we had our doves and we let go doves as a memorial and it was a wonderful day oh wonderful day and when it was done we were packing up Jackie goes oi come here walked over to her and I said what's your problem now because she was small what's your problem now she reached up and she grabbed my head she pulled my head down and she kissed me on my cheek she goes you're effing terrific you are <laughs> God bless you I love you I said, you without the effing, I said, you're terrific and all go. <laughs> and even if I did say that, I wouldn't admit it in a sermon. No, I, <laughs> I said, you're terrific and all go. She said, thank you, boy. I love you. God bless you. I said, oh, God bless you too. And I walked away and the spirit whispered in my ears, there's your urban blessing. Oh, tears just came to my eyes. Hey, tears came to my eyes. Let the people call you Christian. Let the people call you Christian. Let me read to you a blessing. I want to read to you two blessings tonight. 
over the decisions that you've made this night. Over the decisions you've made this night. I want to read you one from the book of Psalms. I want to read you one from Paul. Paul's word to the Ephesians. Over the decisions that you've made tonight. The Lord answer you in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor all your sacrifices. And may he grant your heart's desires and fulfill all your plans. And may we shout for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I read to you from the book of Ephesians. With all that you've heard tonight, and of all that you've ticked tonight, for this reason, we bow our knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name. And I pray according to the riches of his glory that he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his spirit. I pray. I pray that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have power with all the saints. You may have power with all the saints to comprehend what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen and amen. Everybody stand together. In the name of Jesus, I commend you unto him who is able to do far more than you can ask or imagine. In the name of Jesus, I pray the baptism of the Holy Spirit over you. May he fill your lives and fill your hearts. May he break every chain. May he fill every heart. And may the power of the Spirit come to rest in your homes and in your minds. May you be established and may you remain today and always. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you one and all. Hug a few people around you and say stay faithful.